Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Tom Brokaw is perhaps best known for his time behind the anchor desk at NBC News, but his latest memoir provides a glimpse into his Midwest upbringing and the lessons he learned along the way. Is this the story of your success compared to your parents? Or because of your parents? Oh, it's because of my parents. This is Tom Brokaw's dad. He was the toughest kid in town. If a character had been invented by Mark Twain and Charles Dickens, <laughs> would have been Red Brokaw. An elementary school dropout. Yeah. A town tough. I don't think anybody tucked him in at night. Later in the show, Tom Brokaw on his father's reaction to his television success. Your father was amazed uh, to see you, the successes that you had. Did he live to see you on nightly news? He just barely made it. I had gotten the job. I was in play, frankly. You know, there were the other networks were trying to get me as well. Yeah. And Dad called me and he said, is all this true, what I'm reading? And I said, Dad, we've never talked about this before. Why are we talking about it now? He said, as long as I've known you, you've always run out of money at the end of the year. I need to know how much to set aside. Then we'll stay in the Midwest, where Roxana Siberi takes a trip to Chicago, the original location of engineer George Washington Gale Ferris's invention, the Ferris wheel. Built in less than six months, his wheel opened to the public in June 1893. The steel structure was massive, climbing 264 feet, with 36 cars, each carrying 60 passengers. At the time, it was the tallest object in Chicago. Today, an ice rink sits in its place. What was the reception when the Ferris wheel opened here? It was an experience unlike people had ever really had before. You could really sort of lose yourself um, in the experience. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Tom Brokaw, he covered some of the biggest news stories of the 20th century throughout his storied career. As he told our Jane Polly, he credits his success in part to his scrappy childhood growing up on the prairies of South Dakota. Life in the streets of Beijing. He would never have imagined biking through Tiananmen Square. Only one passing bicyclist seemed to know what we were up to. For 20 years, Tom Brokaw was at the helm of NBC Nightly News. In El Salvador, delivering the, the news of the day. Uh, and we have a remarkable development here tonight at the Brandenburg Gate. And sometimes the Play news life. of a lifetime. Play the wall is effectively down. That was one of the biggest stories of the 20th century, and I was the only one there. The only one of the big three. Peter Jennings, Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw. And we were competing all day, every day. This is NBC Nightly News. And then facing off with Tom Brokaw in New York every night. President Reagan today. Also Colleagues still call him Duncan. Duncan the Wonder Horse for his vaunted capacity for work. Never give up. Could explain where that comes from. Brokaw's latest book is a hybrid, memoir and history. A kind of love letter to his parents and the hard-working people of the Plains who shared a never-give-up outlook. Is this the story of your success compared to your parents or because of your parents? Oh, it's because of my parents. This is Tom Brokaw's dad. He was the toughest kid in town. If a character had been invented by Mark Twain and Charles Dickens, <laughs> would have been Red Brokaw, an elementary school drop out. Yeah. A town tough. I don't think anybody tucked him in at night. The youngest of 10, Red Brokaw had a learning disability, quit school in second grade, and went to work at the age of eight. He was doing horrifyingly dangerous jobs. And one of them was digging a deep well, and they would put a rope around my dad's legs and drop him down head first into the well. In those times, nobody batted an eye. When your father is on some kind of agricultural contraption and if he had fallen off his perch, he would have been shredded. There were no rules in those days and if there were federal regulations, they didn't get all the way to Bristol, South Dakota, I gotta tell you. After the Civil War, like other ambitious young men, Tom's great-grandfather went west and got off the train in Bristol. What opportunity did he think he would find 
in the middle of nowhere. nowhere. It was completely barren at that point. And he decided what it really needed was a place where people could find food and find a place to stay. Over the years, the Brokaw House became a local landmark. A family business, everyone worked. Oyster stew and coleslaw, boiled lamb, duck, roast beef, roast turkey, mashed potatoes, peas, squash, steamed suet pudding, that sounds delicious, mince pie, apple pie, custard pie, blueberry pie, orange pudding, assorted cake. Mrs. Brokaw was in the kitchen and made it all. My grandmother, unfortunately, died at an early age. She was only 42 because she just worked full time. Throughout his life, it seems Red Brokaw worked all the time. He wanted to be respected. He wanted the people to think well of him. Your parents on yes. their wedding day. How more handsome can they be? Tom's interest in news gathering may have come from his mother, Jean. A working mother, she was the local postmistress. It was like being the head of a newspaper in town. Everything went through the post office. Red Brokaw was as self-made as a working man could be. A genius with heavy machinery, and he could build anything. Harnessing the Missouri River, the first power comes from the fourth largest earth dam in the world, Fort Randall. A muscular monument to a confident post-war America. The Fort Randall Dam stands astride the Missouri River, built in nine years by the Army Corps of Engineers and an army of working men like Red Brokaw. I think of that dam, and if you build it, they will come. It was a hugely important dam for flood control and other things and for creating power. And jobs. The Brokaw family packed up and headed for Pickstown. Pickstown sounds like a mirage. Pickstown was a magical place, and it had everything you can imagine. It had great schools, it had great hospitals, and everybody came from all over America, mostly of working class. Pickstown was a manufactured town for the people who would build the dam, who found neat houses with state-of-the-art amenities like heat and running water. And at the end of the nine years, they folded it up and shipped it away. The story of Tom Brokaw's success begins in Pickstown. When there was a school play, I had a lead. When there was an event that was going on in town in which they needed an MC, guess who they called? Yankton, South Dakota, is what Tom calls home. His high school resume includes governor of South Dakota Boys State, class president. Meredith Auld was vice president, a cheerleader, the doctor's daughter, and his future wife. You've been married for how long? 60 years. Six O. Oh. A six and an O. Oh. When she was about to marry you, she explains to a friend, well, I don't know if we'll make any money, but life will be interesting. Right. Beyond their dreams. In 1976, Tom's career was taking off. That is Dawn coming up over New York this morning. The new host of today. There is a welcome new addition to this set, a kind of dawn in itself. It is Jane <laughs> Pauley, of course. With a really new newcomer by his side. I knew Gary before he met you. Meredith was a matchmaker. I knew he was showing up in my office a lot. <laughs> Meredith says, not about you. He wants to meet Jane. I said, oh. Well, on behalf of my children, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go see the grandson play soccer. Sarah and I and Archer will be looking around Madrid, and then he goes to camp. The Brokaws dote on their three daughters and five grandchildren. It's a commentary on where we've come in life. You know, we now have a grandson who's going away to a soccer camp in Europe. It seems unimaginable from our early oh, oh, yeah. life, right? Ten years ago, life took a hard turn diagnosed with multiple myeloma, an incurable blood cancer. Tom Brokaw wasn't supposed to live to be 83, but Duncan is still the wonder horse. I've had a bad experience. I kept thinking bad things would happen to me, but as I grew older, I began to develop this condition. And what you try to do is control it as much as you can. And I've had to change my life in some way. I really had to give up my daily activity with NBC. I had to walk away from them as they were walking away from me. I just wasn't the same person. And so for the first time in my life, I was kind of out there, you know, in a place I had never been in my life. 
but what a life it's been. You were deeply formed by your South Dakota roots. You left, but what did you take with you? That you get things done by getting them done. It is my family and my friends who will all tell you, I never run out of gas. <laughs> Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with Tom Brokaw. Something you can only see right here on CBS News Stream. Stay with us. We've got these groups that are really angry about everything. As promised, here's more from Jane Polly and Tom Brokaw. Your father's skills were self-taught. I can't think of the definition of a self-made man uh, that would fit anybody better uh, than no, your father, Red Broca. He would, he, would, he would do things without being asked to do it. I mean, he would go in the garage and he would build a new uh, place to, or not a new place, but a new means of plowing snow in the wintertime. And the engineers would come out and say, okay, show us, show us the, direction for that. He said, it's all up here. You have to come out of the garage and I'll show you how I did it. I'd never known a man who was more intuitive about inventing things. He just loved doing it. My mother wasn't crazy about it because he would never go to the store and buy anything. <laughs> she wanted he said, I can make it. one of those. Don't worry about it. He built you he, a uh, lawnmower. He built me a lawnmower from scratch out of scraps of stuff. You know, we had took the wheels off a, uh, off a cycle. We, uh, my dad found other ways of building all the parts that we needed. It was ugly as hell, frankly, but it went through everything. And I suppose in Pickstown, I was as well known for that particular piece of tool as I was for anything else. And for five years, I was a call to guy in town when people needed to have a tough lawnmower done. Call Broca. I didn't like it because that was that, you know, I'm a talker, not a doer. <laughs> At four years old, you're on the stage of uh, some kind a, of a town event and you introduce it. And in the back of the hall is my, your dad with a, a silver dollar. A silver dollar. <laughs> this was in the middle of the war and I was four years old and they had these huge events and we were on an army base. So I could look out and see all of these people in army uniforms and they had me up there, and my opening line is the only one I remember, which is, they said I was too young to speak a piece tonight. But I spoke whatever it was it was, and when I finished it, I raced back to my dad and got my silver dollar. As a reward for, if, if he could hear you in the back, you got the dollar. I got the, I got the dollar bill. Your father was amazed uh, to see you, the successes that you had. Did he live to see you on nightly news? He just barely made it. I had gotten the job. I was in play, frankly, you know, there were the other networks were trying to get me as well. Yeah. And Dad called me and he said, is all this true, what I'm reading? And I said, Dad, we've never talked about this before, why are we talking about it now? And he said, as long as I've known you, you've always run out of money at the end of the year, I need to know how much to set aside. But the best part was that others also took notice of it. And it was really important to him. And not in a way he would talk about it, that I had arrived at a certain place in life. And I think, even though others knew about this, he would never ever go around beating his chest and say, you ought to see what my time is doing, because he thought that was not the appropriate way to go about things. We had really common uh, pride in each other's ability to do stuff. In your experience as a, a journalist, and your proclivity as a historian, tell me why you think if you do, we're going to be okay. Well, I'll tell you what I think worries me the most right now, frankly, is that we have so acutely divided ourselves as a country. We've got these groups that are really angry about everything, and they're willing to overlook what is going on that they shouldn't overlook. And they're not only angry about it, but they're willing to act on their anger. When you look at what happened at the Capitol, when all those people showed up, wanted to bring down the damn country, we hadn't had anything like that happen before. And one of the things that I said when that was beginning to build up 
was that we have changed in America. And one of the reasons that we've changed, the instruments of communication are now so available to everybody. They can hit a button, go online, and say the most outrageous things you've ever heard. And then the next day, they'll have 200,000 followers. And we haven't worked that out yet. You know, we're not broken. We'll never be broken as a country because we have too much strength. But we damn well better start getting together about how we're going to get through this. And it's going to mean some compromise on people who have strong feelings. They've got to find middle ground at some point. Because if we don't, we'll just be coming unraveled as a country. Up next, round and around we go. Welcome back. In recent years, Ferris wheels have become famous landmarks in many cities around the world, from the London Eye to the world's largest in Dubai. But just how did the famous ride come to be? Roxana Saberi takes us for a spin. For many, summer fun means thrill rides that soar, swirl, and defy gravity. But if you need a break from holding your breath, there's one attraction that lets you catch it. The Ferris wheel, a slow-moving salvation. What goes up must come down. From all that speed. What was your favorite part about the ride? The top part. You could see like everything from up there. It's been turning for more than 130 years. So why is it called Ferris? Not many people know about George Washington Gale Ferris. Paul Derica is the director of exhibitions at the Chicago History Museum. Who was George Washington Gale Ferris? A up and coming engineer in the early 1890s. He'd been born in Illinois, he moves to Pittsburgh. And it's around this time that the announcement goes out that the World's Fair organizers in Chicago are seeking a large scale attraction. One that would top the piece de resistance at the previous World's Fair in Paris. What a lot of people were responding with were designs that were very similar. We'll just build a bigger tower than the, than the Eiffel Tower. But it was George Washington Gale Ferris who had the idea to make something on a similar scale, but allow it to move. Legend has it he was inspired by watching a water wheel turn. He believed all along in the science, in the engineering, and he knew that it could work. Even though it hadn't been done on that scale before. Even though it hadn't been done. Built in less than six months, his wheel opened to the public in June 1893. The steel structure was massive, climbing 264 feet, with 36 cars, each carrying 60 passengers. At the time, it was the tallest object in Chicago. Today, an ice rink sits in its place. What was the reception when the Ferris wheel opened here? It was an experience unlike people had ever really had before. It really sort of lose yourself um, in the experience as the world below you faded away and then suddenly came back into view and faded away again. I am the eye in the sky. It's a sensation that endures to this day. There are enormous wheels worldwide. In London, Las Vegas, and this one in Dubai rises more than 800 feet. This is the brains of the operations. We paid a visit to the command center at the Dream Wheel in New Jersey. What's the blue line? <laughs> so the, the black line is your wind speed, the blue line is your relative humidity, so there's a lot of moving parts. No so pressure. Look, he's, uh, <laughs> he's David Moore is the Dream Wheel's general operations manager. The original Ferris wheel was steam driven. We are 100% um, electronic. No steam, no hydraulics, just all electronics. What makes a wheel so enticing to engineers like yourself? The size, the movement, and it's a pure work of art in the sky, spinning with people on it, enjoying themselves. We're just naturally drawn to it, both as just people, but also writers and artists. Professor and author Karen Levis captures its whimsy in her children's book, Stop That Yawn. We met her at the famed Wonder Wheel at Coney Island, running since 1920. There's just so much juice in the image for all these contrasts that it has, for this sort of old and new and delightful. It appears in so many things. You bought our apartment? Yes. The wheel has its place in popular culture. 
from the romantic in the notebook. You want to ride the Ferris wheel? To the menacing with Orson Welles in The Third Man. I don't think they'd look for a bullet wound after you hit that ground. As for the original, Paul Derica says it came to a halt soon after the Chicago World's Fair. Nobody wants it, so they decide basically to dynamite it, and that's the sad end of the original Ferris wheel. They demolished it. They demolished it. And out of over 100,000 parts... All right, let's see what's inside. This bolt... That's much larger than I thought it would be. ...is one of the few pieces that remain. What Ferris built also broke him. He went bankrupt, got typhoid fever, and died at age 37 in 1896. But all these years later, his invention keeps spinning, bringing a smile to Ron, Tom, and Cougar Peck. How are you related to George Washington Gale Ferris? He is our great, 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 great uncle. Ferris family members couldn't resist taking a ride on the Centennial Wheel in Chicago. When you see all the kids getting off of this wheel and other wheels, how does that make you feel? Yeah, I'm very proud. The tradition's carrying on. What do you think George Ferris would think of all the wheels around the world today? George Ferris would not be surprised at all about the popularity of his invention. He had complete faith in himself. He knew it would work. He would probably say, as he kind of surveyed the world and looked at things like the Wonder Wheel in Coney Island or the London Eye, is like, see, I told you so. This is a great attraction. It really does give you pause, time to pause. Yeah, absolutely. Let's just hang out up here for a while. <laughs> Let the spinning wheel fly. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right back here next time on Here Comes the Sun.